Hello, everybody. Did anyone get a chance to try the almond gluten-free bread? Anybody? It was delicious. It was delicious. I see some nodding heads out there. Welcome to the industry deep dive panel on healthcare. I am pleased to introduce to you Paul Drowen, the CEO of Life Sciences. He has over 25 years experience in the global biopharmaceutical industry and is heading up Life Sciences BC. Please welcome to the stage Paul and he will be introducing the rest of the panelists. <laughs> Paul, did you try the almond bread? Gluten-free. It was delicious, I'm telling you. He's just laughing at me. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. So uh, cheers and good morning to everyone. Uh, we're thrilled that you're uh, with us for the um, uh, deep dive into healthcare and health technology, otherwise known as uh, life sciences uh, uh, to us. Um, just uh, My name is Paul Drone. I'm the CEO and president of uh, Life Sciences British Columbia. And on behalf of our 220 companies, uh, our sponsors and our members, I'd like to welcome you to the BC Tech Summit. Uh, and just before we get started, I would like to say a big thanks to BCIC as well as to Greg Kaz and the team at BCIC that have put the Tech Summit together. We're delighted to be here. We're delighted that life sciences and health technology is part of the showcase. And I'm also delighted to have an illustrious panel with me. So um, just starting on my left, I have uh, Karima Asabar. Karima is the CEO of CDRD, the Canadian Centre for Drug Research and Development. Uh, Karima joined CDRD back in 2009, uh, and she assumed the role of CEO of CDRD um, in um, 2011. And she's really enabled both public and private sector funds to come in to the um, drug research and development. And at CDRD, Canada's Drug Development and Commercialization Centre, which uh, Karima leads, um, she has enabled um, support in excess of 90 million, has grown the organization and has expanded it internationally. This is a great example of how we reach globally around the world, five continents and eight countries. And Karima is also the founding chair of the Global Alliance of Leading Drug Discovery uh, and Development Centres, uh, an association of international peers uh, that are dedicated to translating health research uh, into new medicines. So please welcome Karima. Uh, to Karima's left is Shauna Turner. Shauna is the Chief uh, Innovation Officer at Providence Health. This is a newly created role uh, within Providence. Um, and uh, she's also the Executive Vice President of Research at uh, Providence Healthcare uh, Research Institute and will lead the Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnership. Um, in this uh, leadership role, she's going to build on the culture of innovation, which is at Providence Healthcare. Uh, and she brings to this 20 years of experience as an executive CEO, and she's built successful technology companies uh, whose customers were the Fortune 500 uh, media firms, government, healthcare, and enterprises both here in Canada as well as in the US. Uh, she's also worked in finance and investment as a CEO in Venture Capital and Infrastructure Fund, which had uh, $2.5 billion under management, with holdings, again, both in Canada and the U.S. And she served as the Assistant Deputy Minister in Government, leading innovation, technology, uh, and small business portfolios. Please welcome Shauna. Uh, Ryan Darcy, to Shauna's um, uh, right, from where you're sitting, is the co-chair of Innovation Boulevard. Uh, he's a professor at Surrey Memorial Hospital Foundation, BC Leadership Chair in Multimodal um, Technology for uh, Health Innovation, Simon Fraser University, and is also the head of Health Science and Innovation at Surrey Memorial Hospital. Uh, a neuroscientist by training, uh, Ryan got his BSc at UVic, and then he headed east, way east, uh, for a master's and PhD at Dalhousie, where he specialized um, as, uh, in neuroscience and clinical imaging. Uh, the started heading west, he didn't come all the way back. He uh, stopped in Winnipeg and became a member of uh, the NRC, the National Research Council, and the Institute of Biodiagnostics, a biomedical innovation cluster that was headed up by um, Ian Smith at the time. And he, there he understood the power of the model of innovation, uh, and he went back to Halifax to create the Atlantic version of the Institute from ground zero. Uh, in Halifax, Ryan held positions as a neuroscience at IWK Health Center and associate professor at Dalhousie University. 
Uh, in 2012, um, Surrey came calling and he came back uh, and brought those years of experience and energy to create the brown, um, groundbreaking health technology hub that we know in Surrey as the Innovation Boulevard, a network of government, uh, economics, industrial, educational connections, all working together to develop, build, and deliver world-class innovation. Ryan, welcome. And to Ryan's right is uh, Dr. Brendan Byrne. Uh, he, Brendan is the VP of Innovation, TELUS Health, a self-described self um, technophile. Uh, Brendan is passionate about his role of mobile digital technologies and can play, that can play a role in improving healthcare and outcomes uh, in Canada and around the world. As the VP of Innovation at TELUS Health, uh, his vision of um, uh, how information communication can impact leading and, and continue to lead digital innovation and evolve TELUS Health solutions, both products and services. Prior to joining TELUS, he was an entrepreneur. He started Wolf Medical back in 1998, which grew to one of the largest cloud-based electronic medical record providers in Canada. Beyond that entrepreneurialism, he has 20, more than 20 years experience in family practice, including seven years as the director of Columbia Medical Clinic in um, New West. Brennan is a graduate in neurobiology of Yale, and he did his uh, medical degree at, the university, at McGill University. And on any trip that you take with Brendan, uh, you'll find him early in the morning running and uh, contemplating how to actually innovate and um, improve outcomes. Brendan, welcome. So um, we've asked our panel to um, uh, consider some issues, um, some challenges, and also some uh, opportunities that we have in health care, but also in health technology or life sciences. Um, and just before I, I um, ask them, I thought I'd just characterize for the audience what is the life sciences um, community here in the province of British Columbia. So I mentioned we have 220 companies, uh, 16,000 direct uh, industrial jobs here in the province. But importantly, we believe in this audience, uh, this panel, excuse me, is really demonstrative of how we believe that the ecosystem as a whole in um, health and life sciences needs to come together to ensure that we can develop not only uh, greater health care, better outcomes, but also the commercial enterprise, which is uh, the health industry. And to that end, um, we have 177,000 jobs here in the province, um, and that is the, uh, the hospitals, the health institutions, the industrial sector. It contributes uh, almost 14 billion GDP, and if you take the indirect, which I know a lot of economists don't like that sort of calculation, it's probably closer to 24 billion. So it's a significant contributor to the economy here in the province. Uh, the other piece that's uh, noteworthy is um, we commissioned PwC to do a report that looked at the economic import uh, impact of life science um, and this ecosystem that I just described. And that's available on our website at uh, lifesciencesbc.ca. Um, you should be aware as well that we are the only jurisdiction in Canada last year that had six IPOs. Uh, so, and the largest was the seventh largest life science IPO, which was uh, listed on the NASDAQ exchange. That's PRONI, that is here uh, locally in Vancouver. And we really believe that this is demonstrative of the entrepreneurialism that we have here, but importantly as well, how our community comes together, um, not only to build companies, but of course to impact on um, the healthcare system across the board. Um, so with that, we've asked our panelists to um, consider, again, issues, uh, challenges, and opportunities for the healthcare um, sector, but also for the healthcare industry. And I'd like to ask Karima to kick us off with some um, uh, thoughts, Karima, that you have. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I want to start by just talking a little bit about this process of innovation and health technology development and then the commercialization of that development as we move in towards the impact of that you know, on, on, on healthcare. Um, to my mind, the most important foundational element of that process uh, is a robust ecosystem that supports all stages uh, of the innovation continuum. <clears throat> I think this is really critical, and in BC, I would say some of the successes that Paul just alluded to um, 
you know, have happened, uh, have occurred because we have a strong genesis of that ecosystem. Um, it's certainly not uh, uh, reached its its um, optimal level, and and you know we should be sort of striving to do that. But that, to me, is the fundamental. Uh, um, point in, in moving forward now with the whole process of innovation, uh, the commercialization of that innovation, and keeping that pipeline going. And I think those of you who heard this morning um, the talk by the, the CEO of G, GE, these were some of the elements that came out from that is being able to reach out and collaborate and partner uh, to, uh, to achieve success that nobody not even an organization the size of GE could any longer alone in isolation uh, be successful in, in this, this game of innovation. So strong linkages between the institutions, and I think in BC, you know, um, we, we certainly have um, uh, established some very strong linkages in that continuum. If we look at the innovation continuum, for me, the ecosystem starts with the fundamental basic research where that occurs, which is in you know, great academic institutions and the research institutions, which then you know, needs to be triaged, validated, translated, uh, and, and incubated uh, through the translational centers, uh, and, and then advanced uh, in, into uh, new companies, technologies that are successful, spun out into new companies. We have to bring capital to that so that the, the technologies can further develop, go into the clinic, have world-class clinicians doing clinical trials. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, all of these pieces so far in, in, in BC, we've really been able to do very well on, on, this, on this healthcare side. But you then need to be able to bring in other global partners, whether it's industry, big industry, um, biotech, um, who can then help to take this further into phase three to the, clean, to the market and distribution. So there's a role for everybody in this continuum. We also need foundations, patient-centered foundations, to play a really important role and have a stake in this. This sort of approach of having a highly de-risked, leveraged, collaboration and partnership, where not only financial resources are brought, because obviously, in, particularly if I talk about my world of drug development, you're talking about gobs of money and a decade to, to get something to, to the patient. Um, so it's not just about financial resources, but it's bringing the best expertise, the best talent from all of these different groups in the continuum to the problem, and focusing that together and, you know, in a risk-reward manner, bene benefiting and advancing those technologies. And I was really pleased to hear some of those kinds of discussions around the, the digital world uh, earlier this morning, too. I, I want to take an example, uh, and, you know, I think to demonstrate this really well, of, some, of, of a company that's a CDRD spin-out, um, where we've had some announcements recently in the last week or so at J.P. Morgan and so forth, uh, as a... As a, as a, as a uh, example to show you how this works and how all this can come together in, in, in such an um, optimal way uh, and also accelerate the, how things are done. So if we look at the recent Kairos uh, spin-out from CDRD, an antibody drug conjugate platform, um, and how all of that started four and a half years ago uh, when we made the decision to have a biologics division, we got some seed fundamental funding from the federal government, WD. The provincial government had already provide, provided our, us as an infrastructure. We then were able to establish the platform, hire the people, hire world-class scientists who worked at Amgen, John Babcock, spin out the company in 2013 as Kairos, uh, and then bring other partners to the table, whether it's venture capital or, or uh, um, other companies, uh, and then do this recent uh, partnership with Zineworks, where, which is a co-development, investment, and a potential merger, which would build in Canada our largest biologics company based here in Vancouver, headquartered here. Win-win for everybody. Jobs created here, um, uh, investment coming in, wealth creation, job creation, uh, and building out the cluster. 
uh, jobs for you know all of our wonderful graduates coming out from the academic institutions and for healthcare and for the government focused on the issues around in healthcare uh, that we have today, accelerating uh, new therapies that would have impact to patients, uh, having them delivered in a timely way, and with those partnerships, collaborations even around the delivery of that. Mm -hmm. And, and Karima, I think the value continuum is an interesting piece, and, and CDRD sits right at the beginning of that as you take innovation um, uh, out of the universities and then um, uh, incubate it, and Kairos is a great example. A brilliant deal, if you haven't seen that, uh, with Zymeworks. Um, it was uh, announced last week, and congratulations to CDRD on, on that. Um, I, I think Karima um, exemplifies the early stage and the early development piece, but of course we can't move that through without the help of our health authorities. So, Shauna, perhaps from a, from a Providence healthcare perspective, we'd be interested in your thoughts on the healthcare system, uh, healthcare issues, challenges, and opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, so, I think I, I just want to go big picture for a moment and really talk about um, sort of what we're doing here as an ecosystem and sort of some of the challenges, because we, we often talk about the amazing work we're doing, and we're doing some incredible amazing work. Um, and I think that we do have the full continuum of the ecosystem in place. There are a few gaps still, but if we really look at it, um, I believe that one of the challenges that we have is coordination. Um, it's not collaboration. I think we are outstanding at collaborating here. I think we develop great partnerships. We know how to attract private sector, um, both, uh, both from a capital perspective and a partner perspective, um, and I think CDRD has done a great job of demonstrating that, um, and many of our other organizations. Um, but I think that the coordination piece is really critical. Um, we are still a very small center from a global perspective, and if we want to compete globally, we really have to remember that we are we're a small center, um, and we need to speak with one voice. And so I believe that our biggest challenge really is around that coordination piece as an ecosystem and how we do that. So, um, so I'll jump right from that into the continuum um, of the innovation within our ecosystem and say that um, the, the Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships is a new office, so I won't have um, all of the really great stories that, uh, that perhaps Karima or Ryan or, or, or Brendan has. I think Ryan or Brendan's role is, is fairly new. So. Um, but what I can tell you is a little bit about what we're doing and why, um, why I've chosen uh, this approach or why I believe this is the right approach for, uh, for BC and the ecosystem. So the Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships is, is the bridge between operations, so the health authority operations, and innovation and research that comes out of, uh, mostly out of St. Paul's, from all over the place, from the front lines, from everywhere. It's not just companies. It's not just the commercial side. In fact, I would say there's a lot less on the commercial side than there is on really transformative healthcare models um, and ways of transforming patient engagement um, within the healthcare community. So that's really the type of innovation um, that we focus on, and I think that it's a real opportunity. So to me, when we think about the problem that we want to solve around Canadian healthcare, you talked about health tech, we talked about health innovation, and then we talked about health care. Those are very different things. We talk about health technology, that you know, mostly we're talking about small companies and those kinds of things. How can we engage with startups and those, those sorts of things? We talk about health care, we're talking about delivery of health care. So again, what we're doing is bridging um, those two pieces. So a lot of times when you are a startup company, you're thinking about, you know, you're thinking about market and models and market fit and all of those kinds of things. And then you sort of come to this challenge where you want to find your first customer and hopefully you find your first customer at home. Doing that in Canada is incredibly difficult, excruciatingly difficult. It's a, you know, it is fundamentally from an economic standpoint, we're a closed system, it's publicly funded, focused on standardized care. Um, we need to, you know, zero risk which is impossible, um, and so introducing new technologies is really difficult in that context. And yet we still proceed with, uh, with our developments, whether it's new models of care or new companies, thinking about it in terms of classical market dynamics like we might find in the US. So I think that asking ourselves about the questions that we really need to solve around the business models, who's the payer, how are we going to address the very unique situation that we have in Canada in our publicly funded system, um, and, and how do we actually reach the market? How do we implement innovation? How do we develop um, evidence for new care models? And that's what we're focused on at the Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships. Um, so we have 
two sides. One is the commercial side, where we help uh, them to identify and deliver to first customers. Um, and the second side is really on um, the transformative care models. And we work to refine and work very closely with operations to develop transformative care models that we can test with evidence to introduce into the system um, and do so in a way that actually fits the operational models that are in place. Sean, fantastic, and um, good luck. We're lo looking Thank forward you. to good things coming from <laughs> your office, and I love the operational piece. Um, I also love the fact that it's not just the commercial um, uh, space of healthcare, but it's also the model and the operational piece that you'll bring to bear through your office and improve things, not only for Providence, but beyond that. Absolutely. Um, Ryan, you're no stranger for um, to coordinating things with um, uh, what you've done as a co-chair of Innovation Boulevard. Um, perhaps uh, your view of um, the issues, challenges, and opportunities that exists beyond the coordination, but importantly, um, uh, from an Innovation Boulevard point of view, but also you've seen it from a national point of view, what do you see as um, things that health needs to be focused on? Sure. Uh, so I think, um, you know, what's in my thoughts right now, and, and I think almost always is, is very much in my thoughts, comes down to a couple of ways that you can kind of look at it. And the first, just to pick up on this conference, is really to talk about um, what we saw this morning. So we saw, you know, a lot of great talks around uh, exponential growth versus linear growth. And, you know, this is a healthcare deep dive. Uh, this is the healthcare industry. So anyone who's in this room has to ask themselves, how many of those examples were healthcare technologies? And the reality of the situation is that when you make the observation that, okay, hang on, are we seeing a lot of exponential growth in healthcare technologies? I would say that, uh, you know, and I, I certainly haven't done this analysis, but based on my experience relative to other sectors, uh, I don't think we are. And, and I certainly think that it can be said that we could see a lot more. And when you ask that question, you then have to really say, where, where is it that we need to improve? And this is where I think it's an optimistic, um, it's both a challenge and a huge opportunity for BC. So for BC, uh, I think to pick up on Shauna's comment, it is true that we are not relative to other global centers uh, large. But I think that's in our advantage because that gives us a nimbleness and an agility. And yet we're large enough that we're also always going to be taken seriously on the global stage. So the question around coordination becomes, where are you putting your energies when you're coordinating? And to go back to effectively the gap that we're trying to fill and say, let's make sure our health technologies are exponential, they are hitting the knee of the curve and they are growing up. The, where we always focus, particularly when we have an industry provider come to us, is many, many companies want clinical access. And we have a lot of conversations about the difference between clinical access um, because I can access any hospital just by walking in, and clinical acceptance and integration. And in my mind, I can almost see an equation uh, where on one side, you've got innovation of technologies. And on the other side, if we could shift our culture to coordinate and take our ecosystem and actually innovate the uh, both the acceptance and the integration of technologies into our healthcare system, which is a challenge. It's a huge challenge, but it's also a massive opportunity for the region. So when we come together as a region and as a mosaic and we focus on that side of the equation, I think we'll see big successes quickly. I think we'll start to hit that exponential growth in our technology uptake. And I think that importantly, it allows us to understand that, you know, in my own personal experience working with brain vital signs and brainwave technologies and, and, you know, really seeing that 20 years ago, they made a difference, right? We knew that we had the technology that we proved on a, on a prototype and we proved in, in clinical cases. It's the same around assistive devices and the many, many things we're doing. But the question isn't whether or not that's the value add. The value add is, will we see that being utilized not only in our acute care settings, but in our continuing care settings? And how do we solve that problem? How do we get innovative there? How do we get creative and partner there? And if we can do that, I think BC is very well globally positioned. 
And Ryan, you, you touch on a, a, an interesting point. Um, government as um, a first customer. You know, our biggest customer in healthcare is government. And uh, I think that um, it, it's interesting lead orders and where they're going to come from. How do we embrace innovation into our own healthcare system as opposed to having it go somewhere else in the world to be embraced and, and, and taken up? Um, and I think no stranger to both being a provider um, within the healthcare system as a general practitioner, uh, but also looking for those uh, lead orders at Wolf Medical and um, electronic medical records is, is Brendan. And Brendan, your comments on and thoughts around uh, the issues, challenges, and opportunities in front of us. Well, I, I think as an entrepreneur, I'm uh, deeply optimistic, so I'll start there. Um, you know, it's an amazing time to be in healthcare, though. Uh, and it really hit me, 20, 25 years ago I graduated from medical school and I couldn't have imagined that I'd work for the phone company. Right? So the world has changed a lot, um, but a lot of what's happening has been a digitization phase and we're, I think, in a little bit of a deceptive phase um, where there's a lot of exponential technology that is taking place in, in, in healthcare. Um, and you know, you just start to look down the list of these conver the convergence of this exponential technology. So. You know, your, your computation, your data centers, your, bi your you know, big data, uh, machine intelligence, sequencing, 3D printing, uh, gene editing, uh, biosensors. Um, so we're actually entering a, a, an amazing space and an amazing opportunity. But the exponential forces that are, you know, that are developing and converging uh, are also being challenged and are challenging to, to the healthcare system. Um, so you've got static forces uh, that they run into or, or linear forces. Um, and I think when you start to look at that, it becomes very interesting to try to understand what's going to happen. Um, and, and I think, that, you know, when we look at kind of the, the static forces, you know, you've got things like privacy, security, uh, big issues that I think are solvable. You certainly have a lot around data complexity in healthcare that, 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 that is beyond some other industries, but that's solvable. Um, <clears throat> you've got regulation. That takes time. It's linear. Uh, and then you have culture, and, and I think the culture aspect is something that um, we actually can start working on now. And, and I, I look at that again. You know, one of the things that's been you know privilege is, is to continue practicing. And, and so, you know, as a family doctor, I, I you know I, I look at how personalized medicine is going to come into play, and I realize the the issue is going to actually be a huge cultural issue because, you know, as a doc, I have three patients that all look the same. They have the same you know, diagnosis, um, yet I'm going to have an algorithm in my computer that might tell me to prescribe three different medications to them, and I might not understand that algorithm. So, you know, when I look at kind of our challenge, I think it's around culture. I think we have to figure out how we're going to absorb some of these technologies. Uh, as chief innovation officer at TELUS, my focus is on the, you know, the intersection of digital health, personalized medicine, uh, and wellness. And, and I look at the, you know, those, those three areas, and, and I think that you know, we, we have to figure out how to get these technologies in place. We're seeing some of the technologies that are bypassing healthcare. So companies are being, you know, they're going to wellness. We're, we're also seeing things like you know, applications that can replace you know, functionality, can re replace a primary care provider. Well, they're not going to do that in the Western world, but you know, perhaps in Tanzania where there are no family doctors, aren't enough family doctors, the technology will, will actually come to fruition and we'll see disruption coming back. So, you know, I, I think we have, a, you know, as a healthcare system, we have to look at how we're going to absorb this change uh, and how do we want to absorb that change. Thanks, Brendan. So um, I'd like to ask the panel, and I'm going to combine two of the questions that we um, started to consider as well beyond um, 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 the, what you've heard from the, the panel already. And I guess the first is, the healthcare um, costs and, and how do we actually, as um, a, a number of you have already picked up, you know, 40% of our uh, budget based on public records and public accounts from 2014, 2015 go to health. That's $18.37 billion. Um, it's growing at 2%. You know, it's almost in line with inflation. Um, and the question really becomes, how can we help manage that um, um, increasing costs that's going into the system, but importantly, from an innovation point of view, how do you introduce innovation into a system that is challenged um, from a budget point of view? How can we get innovation into that system, but help um, the system as well control costs? Karima? So um, 
you know, I think we, the panel hit on a couple of really key barriers to, um, first of all, uh, us, you know, advancing and having this exponential growth. And, and I would say to you that there is an exponential growth in healthcare, first of all, before I get to that question, but it's not, it, doesn't continue, it doesn't happen in BC. Halfway through, it, it's taken and happened somewhere else, and that's another another discussion because it's around uh, capital and, and all of the other things that we, we need to continue to do the work. But an important point is the most innovative jurisdictions in the world have to be early adopters of innovation, right? And that becomes a challenge in healthcare for us because of all the reasons we've just talked about. And so to your question, Paul, uh, I think we have to come up, just as we did when we talked about the ecosystem, creative partnering, collaborative ways of developing these new technologies. We have to come up with creative partnered ways in the delivery of these two patients. So in other words, I think that we have to you know, break the walls and, and the, the boundaries between industry, uh, government, uh, the, the health authorities, the patient groups, and figure out new modalities of delivery of innovative, disruptive technologies. Um, to, you know, and of course, evidence-based, but we, we need to, to show, and we also need to have an approach of a longer-term view of cost-benefit. Because I think if you're looking at cost-benefit in your annual budget, that, that doesn't work for healthcare, right? So why can we not be more creative about the ways in which we partner to deliver these new innovations to patients? Brennan, thoughts on the unique delivery of healthcare going forward? Yeah, I, I think Karima actually touched on something really important there, which is, um, so we, we do spend a lot of money on healthcare, uh, but our, our, our view is very short term with that. And so, you know, when you look at industries, uh, there's a company in South Africa, Discovery Health, that has, you know, a long track record of wellness using wearables and other technologies. Um, and they're actually able to, to make the case in terms of, you know, bending the actuarial curve for life insurance. Um, so a little bit longer term play than a year. Um, but when you think about it, you know, 18, you know, almost $19 billion spent in the public sector. Uh, it's $27 billion in BC when you look at pr private and, and, and public. Uh, there's enough money being spent. Perhaps we, we need to be, you know, more uh, innovative in terms of how we, we view the, those dollars being spent. Maybe, you know, there's a, so TELUS uh, has a, a, you know, had a contract, has a contract with the government. It's a billion dollar contract of which 5% is carved out for a strategic investment fund, allows the province uh, and TELUS to work together around some things that might not be able, they might not be able to procure. Um, and and there's, there's been some real success with that in, in terms of home health monitoring and, and other things. So yeah, maybe we should be looking at some, some ways of getting, getting those types of contracts in place in other areas. Ryan? Collins? Yeah, I wanted to just add to that, that I think um, one of the things that is really critical is for the industry to shift towards an outcomes-focused metric. Um, you got to ask yourself, what's your ruler? And if your ruler is uh, based primarily on input metrics, um, you know, how quickly your company grows or how fast you got through your investment stages, it's not really addressing the direct value proposition of your health technology and to address the situation around the growing rise of cost of health care when you start to look at that you will then see problems that you might not have otherwise seen and one key one for instance which um, is very you know easily seen is that if you come to an investor with a technology that's going to take, uh, for instance, a physician and they no longer have to do that job, that's probably not going to be a successful business play because the physicians are the ones that are really the controllers in the health network and they probably want to keep their job. And if you cut their salaries in half with your technology, that's not good. It might be for an investor, but it's not for the clinical world. So, so I think that the degree to we, which we focus on the outcome and make sure that the outcome has a full alignment with the challenge, uh, then you can much better predict success. And Shauna, does that tie into your operational model and improvement, that, that whole outcome piece, and where does that fit? So I think, I think that what Ryan has said is, um, is absolutely correct. And 
So what we're doing, again, as an in situ, uh, so we're actually in the health organization, and that provides access to um, very different points of view and challenge, you know, challenges and such, um, and overcoming those challenges for companies and really sort of shifting the way that they think about who their customer is, who the payer is, um, is absolutely critical. So, yes, that, that fits in. But um, I thought that one of the things that Brendan was saying about uh, the SIFs, that are created by the public-private partnerships for government. I was uh, moderating a procurement panel yesterday, and I just think that that is an absolutely critical space um, for innovation. And you asked the question, how can we innovate without, you know, sort of affecting the cost? How do we innovate within our current cost basket, if you will, um, without creating, uh, creating issues? And I think that the partnerships that can be done around the edges, actually bringing new creative ways to work together. There's innovation that can be done there if we're testing it for evidence, we're really looking at the impact on the system and driving outcomes as the common language, which is what you were saying, Ryan. I think that that is really where the magic can happen. Um, so uh, I'm going to just move, because uh, we talked about the healthcare system. Uh, I think we need to talk about the consumer because the consumer is becoming um, even more empowered. Everyone in this room, a consumer of healthcare, whether it's Fitbits, uh, whether it's um, um, uh, other data sources that we collect our own personal data, whether we get our genome sequenced, we're, we're quickly changing how consumers actually engage with the healthcare system. Um, and to that end, uh, you know, the continuum now isn't just about disease. More importantly, it's about wellness. It's about when wellness then tips into disease and how do we um, measure and monitor that. Um, can you speak to your specific organizations now and um, provide examples where the consumer has been engaged in a meaningful way that is going to provide better outcomes, uh, access to the system, but more importantly, put health into their hands and how they manage health for not only themselves, but also for their families? So, I, um, Paul, I can start. I mean, we're, we're at the, right at the beginning, at the other end of the scale, so very early on. But I'll tell you that even at this very early on stage where we've taken, you know, discovery from the 52 institutions we work with and moved it into development, we've already got patient engagement. And that patient engagement comes through patient-centered foundations. So they have two roles there. One is that they decide and help decide you know, which are the, the priority areas of focus uh, to invest in um, and are very, very active. And so I'll give you examples of, uh, for example, the MS Society, which has an innovation fund and is a big partner of, of CDRDs, how involved the patient group, you know, is in, in, in driving that. But, but secondly, um, you know, they create the urgency you know, they're sitting at the table and you really, it, it helps you to prioritize what you're doing based on, 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 on their drive. Now, you know, we're at a different end. It's a little bit different from the wellness piece that you're talking about. But I'll tell you the other aspect is that they're pushing for preventive and primary intervention, right? So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, Personally, I feel that at the, at the front line, uh, in the preventive stage, in the, in the primary care, the Canada has, has fallen behind. And, and this is where the patients are now saying, no, we, want, you know, we need you to be doing things and focusing on technologies up front that can be adopted. So that's where we're seeing a change of where we're being pushed by patients uh, through the foundations. Um, and they're also, by the way, investing their money and their dollars in the development of the technology. So a very different role. Ryan? I, I think one of the, the examples I get so excited about, it relates to, I'll just start with one statistic, which is the most recent numbers for the number of people that come in a day into Surrey Memorial's emergency is 410 visits. And the, certainly the province and around the world, people are really focusing on our aging population and frailty. And in this case, I think that we're all, we all play, we all know we all play roles. We're consumers, we're patients, we're business uh, people and that sort of thing. The reality is that within Innovation Boulevard, I think what we've been able to do is tap the community, uh, which has our consumers and our specialists. And we've been able to say, okay, let's start systematic research where we actually work on changing the trajectory. So if you have an aging, frail senior, 
we can uh, reach out through our community, through our firefighters or our support networks, identify that ahead of time, and change the path that that person would have otherwise taken. So if, for instance, they have a fall, and the, you know there's some need to go to the emergency room or there's dehydration, you can actually now effectively change that path, and we're working to do that, such that they're not landing in the emergency room, which is actually quite a predictable trajectory because that then usually um, takes them into a care facility and then um, it goes from there. So there's a lot of work in the province that's working on this in a lot of different pockets. I think that we have the ability to change this such that the consumer of our health care at our most important time, which is the end of the lifespan, chronic disease, and it's causing our biggest problems, can actually start to actively manage that situation and not go down that trajectory. But it's always going to come down to the principal theme of what this uh, panel, I think, is, which is pulling together in partnership. Because you cannot succeed in doing something as simple but effective as that unless you partner across a diverse group. And Shauna, for, um, for Providence, the consumer, obviously a focal point of um, what you and your office will be doing, um, particularly within a health authority? Absolutely. But, uh, you know, long before me and my office ever showed up, St. Paul's has been an incredible place for innovation and very focused on the patient, very focused on our populations of emphasis. And so, you know, just to provide some examples, um, we've got the Center for Heart Valve Innovation, um, which has the bold um, objective of actually eliminating the need for, uh, for open heart surgery. So if you can imagine the cost savings of, uh, for something like that, that is an incredible opportunity in the system. We've got inner city youth programs, so again, our populations of emphasis. And if you look at uh, mental health and substance use and those kinds of um, opportunities there, we have incredible programs, very innovative programs. Um, we've got the virtual cardiac rehab programs where we're actually putting the cardiac rehabilitation into the hands directly of patients. So again, they are more in control of their care as the consumer of health, and I think that that will make a big difference in terms of shifting costs. Um, and, you know, to, um, to Ryan's example of how we work with, um, with all of the other, you know, all the other folks that are involved in the community and working in the community and actually have an impact and are interventional um, with, with patient care across the whole continuum, that's one of the things that we've been absolutely outstanding at um, at St. Paul's. So, um, again, whether it's on the mental health side, um, I mean, everybody is familiar with the incredible work that's been done by, uh, by Julio Montaner, um, and, you know, he's, he's done his work in HIV AIDS, and, you know, all of those opportunities, all of those examples um, provide an incredible foundation uh, for innovation at St. Paul's, so. And, and um, Brendan, uh, you mentioned personalized medicine. I mean, there couldn't be anything more consumer-driven than, than personalized medicine. A few thoughts on, on where that will take us? Yeah, so, you know, before I touch on that, I, I want one thing I think we, we have to really look at, though, it, you know, we talk a lot about patient-centered care, um, but if anyone has been sick and been in our system, uh, the patient journey, if you, if you just simply value map from a patient perspective, it, it's horrendous, right? And, and I think that the promise of, of digital health, first of all, is actually to put the information in the hands of patients and, and, and give them control over that information and allow them to understand what they can do or, or you know, what can be done. Um, when it comes to personalized medicine, you know, it, it actually really does change the game because that information, you know, your, your genomic record, you, you can't really imagine storing your genomic record at your doctor's office and the pharmacy's going to have a copy of it and, you know, the hospital will have a copy of it. Um, no, you're, you're going to have a centralized store for that record uh, and there are going to be services that will connect to your doctor, connect to, to your pharmacist. But probably most importantly in how it will be introduced is you'll have the information, you'll be telling your doctor, you know, no, I can't, you know, I can't take that drug because I'm an ultra metabolizer. Um, no, I can't take that drug because of, you know, some, some other interaction. Um, and that, I think, is the empowering aspect of, uh, you know, of digital health. It really puts the information that has been locked up in our medical records, actually puts it in patients' hands. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Ray Kurzweil taps on is, is when, you know, exponential progression and exponential innovation happens when industries become information enabled. Healthcare is not information enabled yet, right? And, 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 and I, so, 
one last kind of thing, and, and it's, it's something that I think, you know, when we're doing these panels, we should actually start to think of. There's nobody here from a patient group, is there? Right? We talk about patients, yes. but you know, I, I'm a doctor. I make patients come to me. Right? I'm in a province where I can't get you know, paid to, to see doctors digitally in an efficient way. Right? So, so I think that there's some of these cultural aspects that we have to really look hard at and take seriously uh, in order to, 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 to change. Um, but the tools are there. So uh, this panel has been hopefully demonstrative of our ecosystem uh, from the early stage development that takes place at CDRD and how that actually, that innovation is commercialized to Providence, where Providence is not only looking at how to provide better clinical care, but actually how to also uh, add efficiency to operations. Um, Ryan's point, I think, is, is um, key with regards to um, Surrey and how do we actually bring innovation into the hospitals, into the, the healthcare systems. And then to Brendan's point that, you know, the opportunity doesn't just exist through our tried and true models of healthcare and healthcare delivery. There's opportunities that abound um, throughout, whether it's now a telco getting um, heavily involved or it's um, looking at um, operational uh, efficiencies that systems people can bring. I think there's opportunities w throughout the healthcare system. Although the challenge of healthcare is to manage better outcomes and to provide British Columbians with the best possible health that we can provide, it's also really important to look at the fact that we have, in our midst, the people, just from examples of this panel, and I know people in the audience, who can really help our government, our healthcare system, provide those outcomes and also introduce innovation. And I, I think that what the panels touch on today are uh, examples of, and I think the, the key delivery and the key takeaway message is, yes, we have an ecosystem. Yes, we have the ability to do this. But we need to coordinate it far greater and much better in order to be able to deliver that goal, which is a, a, a unified, synchronized um, ecosystem here within British Columbia that provides um, better patient care and better outcomes. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank our panel. We're, we're um, just a little bit over t time, but um, Karima, thank you very much for, for being part of it. Shauna, it's uh, been a delight. Ryan and Brendan. Um, I know they'll be around if you have um, questions, but most importantly, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for taking the time for being with us. And we're delighted uh, with the BC Tech Summit that they saw um, the need to have health and health care as a focal point. Thank you all so much, and thank you to our panel. Paul. All right, it's that time again. I seem to be announcing a lot of food today. Day two, right? We just got to keep you fueled. It is lunch. It will be sponsored by UBC. Um, I hope you take the opportunity. How many of you have been to the trade show already? Everyone, go back, do some more networking. How many of you have been in the 40 portal? Is it awesome? Best part of the summit. Go check out the 4D portal. All right, we'll see you promptly back here at one o'clock for the two tracks in the afternoon. Take care.